Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog and I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. And there's a chat function here in Zoom. There's a, I'll type something in the chat just so you can see it. And feel free to ask any questions at all throughout the course of this evening. I expect this class will run about one hour. Now, I hope that I don't all have you thoroughly terrified with that article I just showed you. It was not meant to scare you. It was meant rather to set your proper expectations about what the digital LSAT can be like. If you go to a restaurant for brunch and there's a 30 minute wait, you might be annoyed if you called up and expected there wouldn't be any wait at all. On the other hand, if you call ahead and know there's a 30 minute wait, at least you can plan accordingly once you arrive. And so that's my idea here with the digital LSAT, showing you some of the potential tech issues that could arise. That way, when you show up, if there's a tech snafu or there's a delay of some kind or the proctors are fumbling, with the tablets and they're not properly charged or not properly syncing, at least you know this is what you could potentially experience and adjust yourself accordingly. So basically, you know, no big deal. This happens sometimes and whatever happens, LSAC will make it right. Of course, the best they can realistically do is to simply offer you a free retake. They're not going to add five or 10 points to your score most likely. And so that is at least the nice thing about having the LSAT being offered nearly every month at this point going forward. The October LSAT, of course, is one week away. And if that test doesn't go well, whether on your part or on the part of LSAT with their tech issues, you do have November just one month later. Then you have January about a month and a half after that, February one month after that as well. So plenty of chances to retake in the event that something goes wrong on your LSAT test day. Now, I'm just curious, you know, we have a lot of folks here tonight. How many of you are taking the October LSAT? Just type something in the chat if you're taking October. All right, so we got a couple people saying, oh wow, a lot of people saying October. Awesome, great, fantastic. What about November? Anybody taking November? All right, we have a lot of people saying November as well. Awesome, fantastic. Anybody taking both October and November? Got a couple of yeses there too. All right, fantastic. So I love that. I love the idea of taking both October and November because there is only about a four week gap in between those two test dates, meaning that all you've got to do is stay fresh on the LSAT for another four weeks, maybe doing a timed exam per week along with detailed review of that exam. That alone could be enough. And then if you study on top of that, and focus on your weak areas and improve from there, you could do even better. So to me, that's no brainer because there is a three and a half score band or margin of error on either end. Really, it's a seven point score band. You could basically one day get a 160, one day get a 164, the following day get a 157, and the LSAT is still a perfectly valid exam. So if you score right around your average on October, you could just through luck alone, do three to four points better in November. And if you don't, no big deal because law schools do not average multiple LSAT scores. They only take the highest, meaning that there's really no downside to retaking. There is a new retake limit. Basically, you can only take the LSAT three times in one admissions cycle, which run from June to May. So you could take October, November, and January all within this cycle, but then you wouldn't be able to take again until next summer. Alternatively, you could take it in January, March, June, July, and September, and that would be totally fine because it would be spread across two different cycles. So some things to keep in mind there. But at this point, of course, we're just one week out from October. If something goes wrong in October for the digital LSAT, a lot of times students will ask me, should I write an addendum and explain that there was a tech issue and that's why my score wasn't as high as it could have been? The answer ultimately is no just retake and get a higher score. Law schools understand digital LSAT issues will happen. They're certainly aware of these changes and all the craziness that's gone on with the transition in July and the tech issues in September and October. And there will be some in October, inevitably. I don't want to have a negative um, prediction there, but just things will get better with time, but there will still be issues bit by bit along the way. So hopefully fewer test centers will have issues this coming Monday 
as opposed to last September, this past September, but it won't be perfect. I can almost guarantee that. So short answer is simply retake. If something does happen, whether it's on your part or on the part of LSAC, the admission officers are expecting that and they see plenty of people retaking multiple times. Nothing wrong with that. I know a couple of folks raised their hands to ask questions. I appreciate the, the courtesy, but feel free to just type in the chat if you have any questions at all. I actually got one question here already asking, what's a realistic timetable you should set for LSAT prep, taking into account things like work and school? Very common question I get. It's all about balance, right? So if you're taking the LSAT one week from now, I would say put your work and school on hold if possible. A lot of my students will take off from work the week before or at least the day before, or if it's on a Monday, they take off the Friday just so they can relax a little bit, maybe do another full length of timed exam. So if you can do that, that's great. If you're in school, maybe delay doing a little bit of your assignments until after the LSAT, whether you're taking October or, no or November, you can always play catch up after the exam. In general, I recommend treating LSAT prep like a part-time job, meaning you budget time for it in your calendar, you block it off. Every week you study on Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 12 to 3 p.m or whatever it may be, and then maybe more on the weekends too. So you block it off like it is a part-time job, or if you're in school, like it's at least a six-credit class. Now, obviously, that's a big time commitment, and you might ask why. Well, the LSAT is actually more important than all of undergrad put together. So it definitely makes sense to spend at least, I'd say, 10 to 15 hours per week on your LSAT prep at minimum, and maybe take a lighter course load if necessary. And it is worth letting your grades slip a little bit this semester if that's what needs to happen to get your LSAT score up a few more points. Now, if you're taking the LSAT even beyond October or November and taking it in January instead, then you have all of winter break to focus on LSAT prep, which is also something nice to consider. I have more I can say on that, but I'll, I'll leave off there for now. Max number of prep tests should you do per week? And how many should you do now if you're taking the LSAT one week from now? I typically recommend a maximum of two exams per week, maybe three, if you are studying full-time and have no other obligations at all. Two is more reasonable for most people, though. So that might mean do an, exa do an exam on Saturday, another one Wednesday. The following day, you review the exam you did the previous day. The day after that, you might do some drilling on week areas or review some foundational material. But... Over the span of the next week, I'd say most likely just two exams at most. Make them fairly recent from the 70s and 80s. But don't do an exam every day and don't do exams on consecutive days. That is a recipe for burnout. You definitely want to avoid that, of course. And when you're doing these exams, ask yourself why. What value are you hoping to get out of these exams? Is it to get another high score under your belt to help you feel confident? Or is it because you're trying to cram in the, out of fear that you have not done enough up to this point? I generally recommend doing at least 10 full length timed exams before you take the LSAT period. But if you've done zero so far, don't do all 10 in one week. That is, of course, far too much. At this point, just be happy with whatever you have. If you could do another two, that's great. The value is really just in getting more under your belt in terms of pacing and endurance so that you're ready for that five section experience on test day. And in your review process, of course, go deeper on it. I would rather that you do fewer exams and review them in more depth than just aim to cover as many as possible. And I'll talk more about review in a bit. I'll leave off here for now on that. Got one person asking, on the digital LSAT, can you cross off incorrect answers? Yes, you can. There is a function on the digital LSAT where you can eliminate things that you're not considering anymore and they will gray out. And then you can, of course, focus more on the choices that you are still considering. So that's a pretty nice function of the digital LSAT. Someone else asking, they've only done paper before, how to prep for digital going forward? Great question. So on LSAC's website, there is a familiarization tool at familiar.lsac.org. And I won't display it here due to copyright issues with LSAC, but you can go there. There are currently three exams in the digital format, exams 71, 73, and 74. They're real, they're recent, they're from the past five to six years or so, perfectly relevant, 
and LSAC says they'll be adding more in the near future. The biggest things are that you can highlight and you can underline on the digital LSAT, but you cannot draw freehand on the tablet the way you could on a piece of paper or on your typical tablet or whiteboard. And so keep that in mind. Beyond the three on LSAC's site, there are about a dozen more in Khan Academy, but they don't perfectly replicate the digital LSAT experience. So the best thing you can do is simply take any old exam, whether it's on paper, whether you have the PDF or you're using it from another online source, you just basically look at the screen, load it up on your tablet or on your computer and do your work on scratch paper to the side. Now, as for the question of what tablet should you use, LSAC is using a Microsoft Surface Go, specifically a 10 inch tablet, but any old tablet will be perfectly fine. You can use a Samsung Galaxy, you can use an iPad, or you can use an Amazon Fire HD 10, which is only about $150. So it's fairly reasonable. I'll see if I can pull up the link for you here. Yeah, so it's only about $150. And that, and of course, Amazon has very liberal return policies. So you can always return it later if you decide that it's not for you. Now, I have some people commenting here that the familiarization tool on LSAC's site isn't working that well for them. I would suggest trying a different device. It works okay for me on desktop and on tablet. I would not suggest using a smartphone. It doesn't really have good, it's not very mobile friendly, but a tablet, a tablet should be fine. If it's not working on your desktop, I would say try a different browser or make sure that everything is up to date. Someone else is suggesting to use incognito mode. Great idea if you have any browser plugins or extension plugins that might affect the functionality. Of course, LSAC isn't the most tech savvy organization ever. And so it might only work on some devices or on some browsers over others. But I would definitely recommend before the test, look at that website, get yourself acquainted with it just a little bit. A big thing also is the countdown timer. There's a, there's a five, there's a countdown timer on the upper right of the digital LSAT familiarization tool. And of course, on the digital LSAT itself. And so get used to the countdown timer. Once the five minute warning hits, you cannot remove the countdown timer, which some folks might find stress inducing. So get ready for that, experience it now so that you're not thrown for a loop on test day itself. Someone's asking what to do the day before the exam specifically, rest. Rest, recuperate. I recommend against doing any studying at all, unless not studying would stress you out, in which case do maybe just one game or one passage or a couple of logical reasoning questions, but that's really it. Again, what are you going to learn at this point that you don't already know? And you don't want to run the risk of burnout once again. So I'd say less is more. The day before, just relax, take a hot bath, go to the park, watch movies, see friends, but no drinking or anything like that. You know, keep it light so that you can go in fresh on test day itself. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't do any actual studying the day before. You could though get your get your ticket ready, get your number two pencils ready, get your pen ready, whatever, whatever you want to bring to the test, have that all set, of course, in your gallon-sized Ziploc bag. Make sure that your admission ticket is up to date. They must sometimes change test centers the week before on you. And so double check what is in your LSAC account, reprint it just in case, and know where you're going to go the, the following day. And of course, the LSAC, a lot more are in the afternoon than it used to be, but make sure that you have your alarm set you know where you're going, you have a way to get there, and do not bring your cell phone to the test center. I know this is incredibly frustrating for everyone because we rely on cell phones now. We use them for things like Ubers and, or calling a friend to pick you up. Unfortunately, LSAC is very, very strict with the cell phone thing. They will actually kick people out of the test if they bring their phone. And I heard one case where the proctors actually asked everyone, please bring your phones up to the front of the room, implying they would hold the phones for everyone then they kicked out everyone who had volunteered that they had their phone with them, which I would call that entrapment. I don't think that's really kosher, but they're going to do what they're going to do. Proctors really do vary from exam to exam. Keep in mind, they're doing this part-time. They're not always experienced. They don't always know the rules that well. And so you, your job is to know the rules better than they do so that you can correct them if there is an issue, meaning that you deserve, of course, your break at between sections three and four. You are allowed to bring pencils. You can now actually tilt the tablet 
any way you would like. I actually have something on something on my Instagram from LSAC. This is from LSAC site on my Instagram page. LSAC improves the scratch paper and allows tablets at any angle for the October LSAT. So you are also allowed to bring standard number two pencils to the test. So this means that you can bring your number two pencils, you can tilt the tablet at any angle you want, and the scratch paper is better than it used to be, and they allow scratch paper. They are providing the scratch paper and it's on a eight and a half by 11 booklet, but it used to be cheap newsprint that would tear. They're since replacing it now with sturdier paper and they have this big annoying watermark. They've removed that or downplayed that or something. So you're in better shape than previous test takers. So that's nice to see as well. But again, it's your job to correct LSAC or the proctors if they make a mistake of some kind. Someone's asking about video logic games explanations because some other ones recently got removed. Yeah, I think that's a real shame that they removed those explanations because they were a great resource. I actually have several video explanations of my own on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash LSAT blog. I have logic games explanations for the vast majority of exams ever released. And so for now, at least those are available on my YouTube channel. And so you can feel free to go check them out. I have them for the vast majority of recent LSATs. So feel free to make use of those. And yet to answer Macy's question, yes, you can use scratch paper during the test. And in fact, that is your only way to make any kind of notes. And you can do that, use that throughout the exam for any section. You can use it for logic games, logical reasoning, and reading comprehension. So you can take notes for reading comp. You can make little diagrams for some formal logic, logical reasoning questions. And of course, for any games questions, you can make use of scratch paper there. And so feel free. I had follow-up questions about what to bring to the test and how to use the Ziploc bag. So basically, Ziploc bags, you can use a gallon-sized Ziploc bag to pack everything you're bringing for the LSAT. That includes your admission ticket with your photo. That includes your number two pencils. That includes your snacks like a water bottle, a granola bar, a banana, your car keys, your apartment keys, but no digital items. But these, this Ziploc bag, that contains everything, also personal hygiene products. And LSAC's website has a list of exactly what, is, what you can bring and what you cannot bring. So definitely make sure to take a look at that. They are fairly reasonable, but also at the same time, somewhat restrictive about it. And so there have been issues about what you can bring and what you can't bring in the past. If you have questions for them, email them at lsacinfo at lsac.org and they will clarify and of course email them now rather than later because they're not up at three in the morning the day of the exam answering emails. You know, they're, they might have a two day or three day or even a week long turnaround time for all those emails. And so email them now if you have questions. Think about what you're gonna bring now so you can email them and get a response before Monday. And then even you could print out your emailed response from LSAC, bring it to the test to show the proctors in the event of any issues or disputes. Obviously, it's not guaranteed to, for, to win in your favor at the test center, but it will at least be a piece of evidence that can help you advance your case and hopefully convince them if you are in fact right about whatever you're promoting. What do I recommend for snacks? Snacks, I mean, that's really up to you. I'd say granola bars, a trail mix, a banana are all reasonable, popular choices. I wouldn't bring a burrito. I think that it's something simple that will give you a quick energy boost, but is not going to get put you into a food coma is probably a good idea. But also don't try out for the first time on test day. For example, if you haven't eaten a banana in a year, don't eat it for the first time on test day because you don't know how it will react for you. Instead, eat some, maybe even for if you're doing two more timed exams over the next week, eat your, that same snack you're going to eat at the test, eat it during your practice test to see how it works for you and also just to form that positive association so that you're not doing, you want to minimize the number of new things that you're doing on test day. So whatever you can replicate, like if you drink coffee at exactly 8 a.m. and it takes you 30 minutes to finish it and your test is at one, how does that impact you? What if you drink the coffee at 11 a.m. or at noon? I'm not trying to stress you out here, but I'd say play around with it and find what works best. Also consider, of course, that coffee is a diuretic and you don't want to have to go to the bathroom at the start of section two because that's going to cost you time. So figure out your, whatever your rhythms are and get those figured out now 
rather than later. We also, let's see, I'm trying to relate the questions to each other as much as possible. Again, so yeah, so you can bring number two pencils. I believe you can bring pens as well. I would double check that. But LSAC actually gives you a stylus that has a pen on the other end. So you can, you can certainly use a pen and you can use pencils on the digital LSAT. The proctors should not be taking away number two pencils from test takers as long as they are old school, you know, not, not, not mechanical pencils, not plastic, not with any individual parts. You know, your standard wooden yellow number two pencil is what you want to bring. Don't confuse the proctors. They have enough that they're dealing with already with all the tablet issues. Got one question asking, how important is it to do a mock test before you get too far in your studying? Great question. So when should you do a full length exam? A lot of people do recommend doing full length diagnostics just to figure out your quote unquote weak areas and work on those specifically. I'm actually not a fan of diagnostics because at least at the outset, because they don't really tell you anything new. What they tell you is that you're most likely not that good at the LSAT and not that close to your goal score. But that's not surprising. That's actually perfectly reasonable because you most likely haven't done anything like the LSAT ever up to this point in your life. You don't learn it in school or anything like that. And it's unlike the SAT or the ACT or the GRE even. It's a totally different beast. And so most likely you'll do pretty poorly, especially on logic games. But the good news is that it is incredibly easy to improve significantly, significantly on the LSAT, especially on the games section if you've done no studying at all. So if you start off at a 140, with just a few months of studying, you should be able to get that to at least the 150s. And then if you're studying well and using high quality resources and real exams and giving yourself more time, you could improve even further than that. So just like a diagnostic in a foreign language that you've never studied would go terribly, so too would most likely go the LSAT. But if you've been studying for a few months, you've given yourself a basic familiarity with all sections of the exam, then at that point, you, it's reasonable to look to find out what your weak areas are and to focus on those. So at that point, after most likely a couple of months, you go and you do a diagnostic, you see where you stand, you start to introduce pacing and endurance into your prep aside from simple accuracy. And at that point, you see you take your diagnostic. It's not an ultimate reflection of where you'll be, but it could at least give you a ballpark, a ballpark range. Like if you've studied for three months diligently and gotten a 150, another month of studying isn't that likely to give you a 170 unless you do something radically different. So it could give you a sense of where you will ultimately end up, but still consider that there is room for improvement along the way. And pacing and endurance are real issues with the LSAT, aside from just the content that you can improve on with time as well. So for example, diagnostic number 10, full length timed exam number 10, will, or at least should, go much differently from the first one that you do because you will improve your pacing along the way. You'll get better accustomed to doing full-length five-section exams, which take a long time. They take about three hours, and that's grueling because the LSAT is not an easy thing to, to chip away at for a three-hour period. So just know that it will improve with time. As for how to allocate time on the different sections, great question. I would never time individual games or individual reading comp passages because they do vary in difficulty. But I would know that as a whole on the LSAT within sections, things typically go from easy to harder. So you typically want to work through the easier material and easier questions more quickly to build up a time bank to allow you more time to, to tackle the tough questions later in the section. I'll elaborate more on that later if time permits, but I do want to get to all, all these many, many questions we have here tonight. As for, let's see, someone's asking, do I have recommendations for LSAT prep books and programs? I happen to think that mine are pretty fantastic. Not that I'm biased or anything, but I've spent the past 15 years studying this exam and taking the insights I got out of that studying and putting them into my books and courses. And so I have pages on my site listing the details of those. I won't get too much into them now, but my day-by-day -day study plans are especially popular and they're actually included within my LSAT courses. So if you join my course, you'll get a customized day-by-day -day study plan laying out exactly what to do 
every single day over the course of your prep in conjunction with my LSAT course video lessons. But you can also get the study plans separately if you want to study on your own. Let's see what else. Is it easy to skip around on the digital LSAT within a single section? Yes, you can click left and right arrows to go back and forth between different, between different questions. And they're also demarcated where a new, a new game begins and an old game ends, so you can see exactly where you want to focus. You can also flag questions to come back to later on the digital LSAT. And so I said about pacing earlier that I might speed through the easier ones to save time for tougher ones, but at that same time, especially in logical reasoning, I might flag three or four very difficult questions that I don't want to deal with in the moment. I would rather skip those questions and come back to those later after I've tackled everything else. Because sometimes questions 15 to 22 are actually harder than questions 23 to 26. But whatever the case is, I don't want to do questions that are tough for me at the expense of doing other ones that might be easier. So for example, if I don't like parallel reasoning questions or questions on philosophy and morality or principal application, I might just skip those if they're tough for me and come back to them later because after all, everything is worth the same. Someone else is asking, does the digital LSAT show one question at a time or does it show multiple questions on the screen? Great question. Great question. Unfortunately, you can only see one single question at a time on the digital LSAT. They narrow what you're looking at to one single question. And on reading comp, you can have your passage on the left and the question on the right, but you still have to scroll up and down to see the entire passage. You can't see the whole thing at a glance. There is a passage only of you, but even that won't fit the entire passage. And that would prevent you from seeing any of the questions associated. So you have to play around with that a little bit and see what you like the best. Someone's commenting about digital LSAT highlighting, saying that it didn't work, it wasn't that precise with the stylus. I've always been trained by highlighting throughout the passage. Great point, great question. So the highlighting function on digital is unfortunately not that great. The stylus is not that great. It's not super responsive to test takers, meaning that you are better off using your finger as, as I think Sylvia commented. That's a fantastic piece of advice. Yeah, your finger, you can count on that and it's much better than the stylus. So you can try the stylus and practice with one if you like. Amazon Basics has a cheap one for like 10 bucks or something. But ultimately, your finger is probably what you want to count on for sure at least. And yeah, so about the flagging, you can skip questions and come back to them later within the section. So the flagging tool on digital is really useful for this because it easily allows you to see at a glance everything that you have flagged, everything you have not bubbled in, and you can come back to those pretty easily within the section. But once you've gone on to section two of the exam, you cannot change anything at all about section one. So I hope that addressed that question. Got another one here, uh, basically about fluctuating scores. Someone might get perfect on games, then get only half right on the next test. Why does that happen? And what can you do to get your score to be more steady or reliable or consistent? That's a great question. And so score fluctuations are incredibly common, but all my students' scores fluctuate. Nothing is ever perfectly consistent. And like I said earlier, the LSAT has a margin of error of three and a half points on each end. So that's a seven point band. You could get a 160 one day, a 167 the next day. And that's within what LSAC would reasonably expect with their analyses. So it's, it's, it's just, that's just what happens. But I mean, obviously your fluctuations of getting half right versus perfect is a much larger range than that. And so I'd say, honestly, work on games. Work on games and work on your ability to remain calm and collected, even if you're being thrown for a loop, because LSAC has, in recent years, increased the difficulty of logic games significantly. And so there are all these weird curveball games, the likes of which had not been seen in over 20 years, and now they're suddenly coming back. And so you can prepare for that. You can do all the tough games ever released. I actually have a big list of them I will share with you in the chat here. And this is like every curveball weird game from exam number one up to the present day. 
And so you can work on those tough games specifically so that you're ready to adapt yourself when the situation requires it. That's what I think is most likely happening here. And as someone said, like the circle game, yeah. So circle games have, are one of those rare things that only come up every, every now and then, but they came up very recently actually. And so those who studied the weird games were prepared, but those who had not studied weird games didn't really know what to do. And so LSAC wants to make sure that you are not blindly copying someone else's technique and that you're not just only able to handle ordering games and grouping games. Rather, they want you to handle pattern and circle and mapping and anything else weird like that. Because the general principles underlying the game section are the same, regardless of what the diagram may look like. It's about taking rules, making inferences, holding abstract principles in your short-term working memory, and then applying those again and again and again. That's how you keep yourself more consistent by being ready for whatever they throw your way. Because it sounds like if you could do perfect on games, then you are very good at games, but maybe you're only good at like the normal games, at now at least. But the fact that you, you can do perfect on normal games means you can get there with weird games. It might just take a little bit more practice. As for the best method of preparing for logic games, I would say do games by type at first, then do them in sections. So don't just open a random section and start doing games because then you won't see the patterns as easily. Instead, I would say, focus on the easiest ordering games, then moderate ordering games, then difficult ordering games, then easy grouping, moderate grouping, difficult grouping, and so on. And my study plans actually lay out exactly how to do this, telling you the exact specific games to work on by type, both progressing by type and within that by difficulty, so that there's a system to how you're going about it and you're not giving yourself anything too difficult too early, but you're giving yourself rather exactly what you need when you're ready to handle it. And so you do ordering, then grouping, then combinations of those, then all the weird stuff like circle pattern mapping that I laid out and linked to in, that, in the chat here. Then you introduce timing after that. So you do everything first untimed, then you introduce timing. And that's part of my general framework for study plans that I call the laser approach to LSAT studying. Laser is an acronym standing for learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. Learning is the theory, building your foundation first, like reading chapters or watching videos. Accuracy is doing individual questions by type to get a sense of what the patterns are within that type and how to approach each. S is for sections, doing timed 35-minute sections to work on your pacing. E is for endurance and exams, doing full-length five-section exams and R is for review. Now, I just briefly want to touch on the news about logic games. Logic games are not going away, at least not anytime in the near future. There have been a lot of media reports around this, but those reports were based on what I think is a misreading of LSAC's policy statement. And I will actually share that statement with you here. This is their press release so that you can see exactly what was going on here. So this is basically, there was, there was a lawsuit a blind test taker was suing LSAC because logic games were unfair for him, in his opinion, because, well, diagramming is incredibly important for logic games. And if you're blind and you can't see the diagram, you are at a relative disadvantage. And so LSAC settled the case with the plaintiff who was suing. And the, the pr press release had all these details about the case. You can read if you like. I'll share the link in the chat. But what I want to call your attention to here is this particular text. And this is kind of like an LSAT style analysis we can do here. But basically, LSAC said they are going to research and develop alternate ways to assess analytical reasoning, aka logic game skills, as part of reviewing the entire exam. Consistent with the, the agreement, the settlement, LSAC will complete this work within the next four years. They will complete the work of research and development into alternatives in the next four years. That does not necessarily mean they will remove logic games within four years. Additionally, they, they strangely say they will, this work will enable all prospective law school students to take an exam administered by LSAC without the current games section. It will enable everyone, does not necessarily mean it will require everyone to take an exam without games. And it's not clear exactly who will be taking this non-games exam. So, Something, something to keep in mind, the importance of careful reading here. And I'm under the impression, honestly, that the plaintiff's attorney 
may not have actually understand, understood what he was agreeing to because he had a dispute with LSAC when LSAC released a statement after this one emphasizing the research portion of their commitment over the removing games commitment. And again, on my Instagram here, I have a, a letter from the plaintiff's attorney here, and I will actually just share a link with you to it because it's not going to be legible in the, in the share. But basically, the plaintiff's attorney has a different opinion of what this means. He thinks games are going to be removed. LSAC doesn't think so. So we'll see what happens. But this does, again, show the importance of reading carefully and being precise with your speech and with you, what you write in your settlements and contracts and documents and things of that nature. But short answer, games are most likely not going away anytime soon at least. And so for anyone applying to law school in the next year or two, you will almost certainly still have games on your exam. Someone was asking about the score band, if I could clarify about that. Basically, standardized tests are not perfect. They are pretty close to perfect as far as things go. They're, they're aptitude tests and they're pretty consistent. Not that they're, they're the best exam ever, but it's perfect in that it's pretty reliable, pretty steady. The same person will most likely not get a 171 day and a 150 the following day, but you won't get exactly the same score every single time because there is variation. One exam could have easier games, next one has harder games, and if you're good at games or not, that will affect your performance accordingly. Additionally, you might not like a certain reading comp passage, or you might not, just might not be feeling good that day, and that could affect your performance. So all of those factors put together lead to a certain degree of, of chance involved, meaning that if you, get a, if you deserve to get a 163, and that's your perfect ideal average, you won't get exactly 163 every single time you take it. You might do three and a half points lower or three and a half points higher on average. And that's where that seven point band comes in. So if you deserve a 165, you might get as high as a 169 or as low as a 161 and anywhere in between, potentially. That's what it means. Someone else asking about the writing section. So yeah, so the writing section is another thing that has gone digital this year. Back in June, they made the change where it's no longer administered at the test center itself. Instead, you are doing it from home, on your own time, you still have a time constraint of 35 minutes and they are monitoring you with a webcam and microphone to make sure it's really you doing it for security purposes. And you have up to one year to complete the writing section after you take your scored administered LSAT, but you're not doing it at the test center. And I wouldn't say you should delay it for months and months because you might forget. And LSAC will not release your score to law schools until you have completed a writing section successfully. And one thing you should know about the writing section is that some people have had their writing sections canceled because of tech issues or because there was something confusing or unexpected in the, in the webcam monitoring. So for example, if your roommate is in the background, that's a violation of security and they will cancel it. Or if you have other things on your computer screen that pop up during the section or like something beeps like or your phone rings or something that could potentially invalidate your writing section so you want nothing at all else in the room that could be an issue and they have they have a, an article with details on this but just be aware of the broad strokes of this again up to one year to complete it law schools are more likely to look at it now because it's typed rather than handwritten so it's easier to see easier to read something to keep in mind there but just, that's just some general stuff to be aware of. How, as for how you sign up for it, it's within your LSAC account. And if you've already done a writing section, you don't need to do another one going forward. If you, even if you have a paper handwritten one on record, that counts and is sufficient. You can pay another $15 or so to do it yet again, but you are not obligated to do it again. So I, I think that handles that all the questions related. If not, please feel free to let me know. Someone's asking about if they want to apply to start law school next fall. Is November the last opportunity to take the LSAT or could you take it again and still apply within this cycle? The short answer is yes. You can take it in January and still apply this cycle. You can even take it in February and a lot of schools will still take the LSAT, will still take the LSAT for this cycle. But a couple of things happen. Your chances decrease a little bit 
and there's less scholarship money available. So there, law schools do have deadlines, but they're somewhat soft and flexible in certain cases, and they're, they're lengthier than it used to be. It used to be that like February was late. Now, February is okay, and March would be late, but some schools would still actually take, take March. It varies from school to school. It's not an overall consistent thing, so I would suggest contacting individual law schools if this is a, if this is a concern for you. But I would also consider strongly that if you're taking it after January, that you consider waiting until next cycle to apply. So you wouldn't actually start law school until fall 2021, and you would apply ideally beginning of fall 2020, just to maximize your chances to, and to maximize the scholarship money available because law school is an incredibly big investment. And cycles in general, they run from, the LSAC's testing cycle runs from June to May, but more specifically, law school admissions will open typically in September and run until the spring, but exactly when it ends is somewhat vague because again, like I said, it varies from school to school. But on average, the earlier you apply, the better your chances and more scholarship money available. But you could take the LSAT in November and not be under any significant disadvantage at all. November is still perfectly early in the cycle and there's still plenty of scholarship money available and your chances are still pretty high. And it's worth applying a little bit later even if it would raise your score by only a single point. A single point increase alone would make it worth delaying your application because it's the biggest factor in your admissions chances and that one point means a lot. One point could lead to thousands of dollars more scholarship money or getting into a better law school, which is why I so heavily emphasize the value of retaking. It's the easiest money you'll ever make, period. Now, what happens if your retake score is lower than the previous? That's a question I got here. No big deal. Law schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest. Now, obviously, it's better if you improve on a retake rather than staying the same or decreasing, but they still will consider the highest because that's what they have incentive to do. The U.S. news rankings, which are oh so important, especially to admission officers, are based on, how, are based on schools' LSATs and GPAs of the matriculating students. So if you can help them raise their average or their median number, they have reason to want you and they can throw money at you to get you to choose their school. So again, no big deal if your score goes down on a retake but I wouldn't retake it five times. At a certain point, enough is enough. Someone asking, will LSAC remove the game section or not? It's unclear what will happen in the long term, but in the short term, it won't, it won't be going anywhere. So if you're applying in the next year or two, you will almost certainly still have games just as it has been since 1991. And if there are any changes, LSAC will announce them very far in advance and they will make practice problems available of any new question type far in advance. It's not really something for you to worry about now. It's just been making, just been making the news lately, and I wanted to clarify a little bit about it. Someone's asking, if November is the last test that you want to take for this cycle, when should you apply? I would say apply as soon as possible. Apply immediately once you get your score back. So once you, if let's say you take the November 25th LSAT, you, you have approximately three weeks before they ter- give you your score back. Despite the fact that it's digital, you're not getting your score back any sooner, although hopefully that will change with time. So during those three weeks while you're waiting, you can work on your personal statement, pull together any optional essays, make sure your recommenders have submitted the recommendation letters, and I would request those now if you haven't done so already, just because they're an external factor that you cannot count on 100%. They're they're very busy. They have other things to do. So ask them now and keep bugging them until they submit the letters because you don't want that holding up your application. So you work on your letters, your personal statement, any optional essays, any character and fitness issues, whatever they may be. Pull that all together during those three weeks. And maybe now also in the meantime, if if you're taking breaks from your studying and hit submit the second you get your score back, assuming you want to apply with that score. No reason at all to wait after that point. Got one question. How do I advise improving on LR? So biggest thing is, and you say that you're going for, you're, you want to improve from getting about seven or eight wrong, reduce that to getting only three or four wrong. At that point, 
when you're only getting seven or eight wrong, that means that you already have a pretty good foundation in the section. And at this point, you're probably getting hard questions wrong simply because they are hard. It's not about question types anymore. It's not like you're seeing a big trend with strengthening questions or flaw questions. These are just really difficult questions. And so at this point, it really is about your review process. Specifically, you want to be you want to improve that review process, first of all. Most students just look at the right answer and say, I get it now and move on. Really, you've got to look at your own thought process. What was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong? And what is discouraging about the right answer that pushes you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct? There are patterns in how LSAC designs these questions. Specifically, you want to see what are those patterns of encouragement towards wrong answers and traps of discouragement away from right answers. There are many patterns in how LSAC does this, too many for me to list. But one big one I love to bring up is relatives versus absolutes, weak language versus strong language. For necessary assumption or must be true questions, you want to gravitate towards more moderate language. It's more likely to have been correct than more extreme language. And so Tempting wrong answers will use the exact same phrases as the argument did, but they will be a little bit too strong or more strong than they should have been. An example of a relative would, or versus absolute would be like A is better than V, A is better than B versus A is the best out of all the options. That would be too strong. So you want to look at your language and look at what particular traps you are most likely to fall for so that you can avoid making those same mistakes again in the future because LSAC really does repeat itself. I would also say, make sure you're doing enough questions. You know, one student I was talking with earlier said that she had done 10 exams worth of practice problems, which is great, but that's only 10 exams. That's only 40 games, only 40 passages. I would do far more than that. You have 88 numbered exams and several more that are unnumbered. And so if you have the time, I would say do at least 20 or 30 to really expose yourself to a wider variety of questions and so that you can also start to see things repeat themselves because LSAC really does repeat itself a surprising, to a surprising degree. I actually have an article on my site where I lay out logic games that repeated in virtually identical form over time. And I'm sharing the link with you here for that. Because basically, if you can start to do enough questions to see those patterns or you can use my resources where I lay it out for you. You can then see a new question and automatically relate it back to a, a one you've done previously rather than reasoning through it for the first time under timed conditions, which of course would be extraordinarily difficult. And so work on your review process, actually articulate it, write things out for yourself, type it out, keep a mistake log or a journal, talk it out with a friend or a coach or a tutor, somebody who can really help you elaborate your reasoning. Not that they would necessarily even contribute much. Like you, could talk, you could talk to your dog if you want. The point is that by talking out loud, you are forcing yourself to articulate it in your own words, ideally without even looking at the question, so that you can really make sure you thoroughly understand the argument or the passage or whatever the case may be. And then look back at the question or explanations out there and make sure that you thoroughly understand it for yourself. But do not use explanations as a crutch not even my explanations. They're there as a resource, but first puzzle through things on your own. Let's see other questions here. How can, someone's asking, can I expand on how scores can have an immediate impact on scholarship money earned? Great question. Well, basically, if your LSAT score is above the median of a school to which you are applying, that school has special reason to want to attract you to choose their school because if you choose to go there, then you will raise their average median by just a little bit. And if they do that with 20 applicants or 50 applicants, that could actually have a significant impact. And so they will basically give you a discount on tuition to lure you or attract you to choose their school over another. Kind of like if on a kind of like, let's say, if you're, let's say you have a 175. And you could reasonably go to any top 14 law school if you have a good GPA as well. But a school ranked 50 has a median LSAT score of 165 or 155. You're way above their median. And 
some people would say you'd be crazy to choose their school. But what if they gave you a full ride and gave you zero tuition? You can go for free. Would you do it? Not everybody would, but for some people who want to stay local, that might be a reasonable course of action. And in that case, they, they might do it. And if schools make enough of those offers, some people will say yes. And the dirty, dirty little secret about law school admissions is that most people are not paying the sticker price for tuition. You go on Yale Law School's website and you see over $50,000 a year. Not everybody's paying that, guaranteed. And obviously, Yale doesn't really need to give scholarship money for LSAT scores, most likely, but lower ranked schools do. And there are plenty of low ranked schools that are private that still charge Yale level tuition. Even schools ranked 30 or 40 might charge forty-five or even $50,000 a year. And that to me is unreasonable. But if you have an LSAT score above their median, you don't have to pay that. And other people who are below or at their median are essentially subsidizing your tuition because you're paying less, they're paying more. That's how the school makes its money in the end, aside from donations, of course. But LSAT scores are worth dollars. And it's the, like I said, it's the easiest money you'll ever make. Got a question here from Todd. If your November score isn't where you want it to be based on your average of recent practice tests, should you still apply immediately afterwards and risk a rejection or should you study more and take it in January? Great question. I would say if your score from November is not where you want it to be and you don't expect that it'll get you into the school you want to go to, then I would wait and I would take in January and apply with that score. Alternatively, if you are kind of on the fence about it, you could apply, then retake, and submit an update to that, to that school with, with a, in the form of like a letter of continued interest with this major update of a new score. And schools might reconsider at that point if they have you on the wait list. But once they've denied you, it's kind of a different story. You might need to wait a cycle. This is a little bit out of my wheelhouse because it's admissions, not LSAT, but that's my general intuition about that. Someone's asking, are schools, scores, and medians available to applicants? Yes, they are, actually. LSAC themselves has made this information available. And I'm going to share the link with you here in the chat. You can basically take that link, input your undergraduate GPA, and your actual or predicted LSAT score. And it will give you, it will show you on a graph how you stack up relative to other other students, basically other matric matriculating students at that particular school. So you can see at a glance how you stack up. Are you above? Are you below? Obviously, numbers are not, are not everything, but they are the number one most important factor. And so that can do a lot of the work for you to show you where you will ultimately end up. So I hope that's helpful to you there. But yeah, they're available for every single law school out there, period. If you're looking at the, into the school selection, Another great resource is Law School Transparency, which takes a lot of publicly available data and makes it more easily digestible. Things like law school's employment records, how applicants, and how, how graduates tend to do in the job market post-graduation, tuition, dollars, things like that. They're all available at Law School Transparency. Amazing resource. I would highly recommend checking that out. Now, I've gotten a ton of questions here tonight. I'm really blown away by the level of engagement here. And I thank you all for asking your questions and being so engaged with me here. I don't think I'm going to be able to get to all of these. So if I don't get to your question, I apologize. Please feel free to reach out and I'll try to address it personally over email. I'm going to take just one more and then I'm going to wrap, wrap up for tonight because I do want to be conscious of your time. So this last question here was about how to approach logic games on digital, given that you can only see one question at a time. Because I do generally recommend doing orientation first, then local if questions, then global questions. On digital, you cannot see the entire spread of all the questions at, at once. You can only see a single one at a time. And so you might want to adjust and simply do them in order, or you might want to click those left and right arrows I referenced previously to go back and forth to see the lay of the land. It's something to practice. That's why you want to do the digital LSAT familiarization again at familiar.lsac.org. So check that out, play with it, and choose your, you choose your process accordingly. So anyway, that's it for tonight, folks. I hope you found this helpful. I appreciate your spending your Tuesday evening with me here and taking the time. Again, 
please feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward. I'm happy to help however, however I can. Please keep in touch, everyone, and have a good night. Take care. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.